So I'd like, if I could right now, just to uh, welcome everyone to another um, installation of our Ortho Evidence Insights World Tour. We've been traveling around the world, and here we are virtually uh, in Australia. Uh, looking forward uh, to another great presentation, just reminding everyone that by design, these sessions are meant to be small group interactive sessions. This is the reason we have not created the webinar style, but rather more of the face-to-face -face virtual style. What we would like to ask is a couple of very straightforward uh, processes. So we'd like you, if we could, to uh, remind you, first of all, the events recorded. And secondly, that during the presentation period, if you could stay muted and off video, once that's done, we will encourage you to come back onto video uh, so we can have a robust discussion. I will most certainly be having uh, lots of questions for our guest speaker, um, and I suspect you may have a few as well. So if we go again just now to the actual presentation, if orthopedic surgery were a drug, would it get approved? A pretty provocative title, but certainly uh, one that I would expect from a colleague uh, and a friend and professor of orthopedic surgery, I think many of you know, uh, Ian Harris. Uh, Ian um, has been a trailblazer overall with respect to his thinking uh, around these issues. And certainly uh, with this particular approach, I'm eager and excited to hear uh, what he has to say about orthopedics. Ian, welcome to the uh, OE World Tour uh, and myself as Mo Bindari, the Editor-in-Chief, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks very much for that, that kind introduction. I'm, uh, I'm going to share my screen and put my slides up. Looks um, great. Yeah, it looks great. That's okay. All right. So yeah, uh, for, the, for those of you who don't know me, I thought I was talking to a uh, sort of an unknown audience and I just flicked through the attendees and half of them are from Australia. So, <laughs> um, so for those of you who don't know me, um, yeah, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I mainly um, specialize in uh, trauma, um, but um, I'm also kind of like a, a trialist a researcher, um, clinical research mainly randomized trials and things like that. But I'm also very interested in the evidence base for surgery. And this title actually came from it's sort of a genuine question that I asked myself. Um, so I'm going to explain how I came to that. Uh, first, just want to declare that I don't have any industry funding or relevant shares. Uh, and I apologize. I've just run through this talk now for the first time. And I realized um, that it must be on timer because the slides are flicking through. Um, so if that's going to be a problem, um, yeah, all right, if that's a problem, I'll just remove all timings in a sec. Um, so this is an overview. Uh, we're going to look at what the evidence level should be for surgery. We're going to look at what the current evidence requirement for surgery is and what the evidence for a lot of what we do is and what we can do about it. So what should the evidence level be? Um, I think most of you would agree that we really should have comparative evidence. I don't think this is too unreasonable. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying you need to do a placebo randomized trial on every single procedure that we do. So, uh, you know, I don't think, I think that would be unreasonable, but I think most of you would agree that we really need to look at comparative evidence. We need to have some evidence that doing this operation is better than not doing it. Uh, that's the minimum. I mean, that's the minimum for any drug or any kind of treatment we want. Um, and I think that the evidence should be impartially reviewed by a multidisciplinary expert team. You know, it's not just your single opinion or my single opinion, for that matter. And there should be some kind of formal structures for approval. So this is really what we should have. I, I really don't think this is too much to ask. I mean, you know, the, the bar for, um, you know, sending rockets off and, and uh uh, doing other things in other disciplines of science is, is probably a lot higher than this. So if we're operating on human beings, I think we really need to you know, have this as a minimum. Comparative evidence, uh, a review of that evidence, and then formal structures for approval. Now, the reason I've framed it like that is because I think it's reasonable and because there's very good examples of this in Australia. So in Australia, we have something which is um, very uh, well respected the world over. And I've seen many times other countries refer to Australia's PBAC. That's our Pharmaceutical Benefits um, Advisory Committee. And they're the ones that decide which drugs 
will get reimbursed by the government and so-called listed. We have this thing called listed. Once they're on the list, um, the drug companies are happy. If they're not on the list, it's very difficult for the drug companies. So um, this, is, this, I think, is, is ideal. Um, uh, drugs are available at reasonable prices because they're subsidised and they're only subsidised if they actually work. Um, there's very little external lobby power, lobby groups that can do much about this because these people, it's a very um, uh, transparent uh, process. There's a lot of rules in this document, if you look it up, as to um, who is on the panel, uh, managing conflicts of interest. Um, it's, it's very strict and all the decision making is, is transparent. So that's fantastic for drugs. What do we do for surgery? Well, it just so happens in Australia, we do have a similar thing. It's called MSAC. And MSAC is the Medical Services Advisory Committee. And I had the good fortune or the, the bad fortune of sitting on MSAC uh, for some time a little while ago. And uh, it was fascinating. I, I couldn't believe the expertise of these people. It's a whole room full of people who are experts in, in you know, health economics, uh, epidemiology, you know, surgery whatever and these people decide if something gets listed or not so for instance if a new device comes out for uh, for spine surgery it's a disc it's a spacer it's a something or other it goes through this committee and boy they really go through the evidence and if there isn't good evidence that this works it does not get listed but it made me ask the question when i was there i said to the people that were running it, I said, this is fantastic. Like, you know, the, the service you offer here is, is world-class. It's, it's just so good. But what about all the procedures that are already on MSAC? So MSAC only came into being in the 80s, mid eighties. And so all of the procedures that we're already doing, so all of the, the operations that we do now, were just automatically grandfathered in and nobody subjected them to any tests whatsoever. They just get funded, they're on the list. So new procedures, you know, that's really hard to get through, but old procedures, they just get through. So what is the current evidence requirements? Not a whole lot. It's different for devices and procedures. So devices need to be at least similar to previous devices. We all know how that worked out uh, with the uh, um, uh, uh, metal on metal hips or certain brands of them, the ASR, uh, didn't work out too well. Um, procedures, eh, pretty much do what you want. I know a couple of uh, surgeons who started doing the anterior hip approach for uh, fractured neck of femurs in, in older patients because they felt like it, broke a whole lot of femurs, but there's no problem. Like there's no rules around what you can do. You can, if you want to do like a medial approach to the hip or something, you just start doing it. There's no real problem. Um, for devices, I, I think, you know, we're so attracted to new devices. I love this paper. This is from the Australian Registry uh, some time back now, but they looked at new versus old prostheses. So they looked at uh, prostheses that had been introduced um, in the last, uh, I think, five years or so. Um, and they found, first of all, that most new prostheses had been used less than 100 times, uh, which is crazy. But they looked at the ones that had been used commonly and they compared them to the old ones. Now, nearly 30% of the new prostheses were worse than the old ones, and none of them were better than the ones they replaced. So that's kind of where we are. Um, but the whole, this whole problem of being able to do whatever we want, but not, not actually find out if it works, is crazy. And I think the whole ethics environment needs to be turned on its head. Um, this is a perspective piece that we wrote for the MJA. And it basically says that. It says that if you want to do a new procedure, you don't need ethics approval. You can just start doing it. But if you want to find out if it works or not by calling up patients and getting information from them, you're not allowed to do that unless you have ethics approval. So to me, there's, there's no ethics approval required to do something new. But if you want to find out if it works, you're barred from doing that without going through these hurdles, which are getting higher and higher. So there's certainly some, some problems. And this whole burden of proof thing really bugs me as well. The, the problem is, uh, in what direction do we want the burden of proof? Does it, does it lie on the proponent or does it lie on the researcher to come along later? So do we have to prove that something is effective before we use it, like we do for drugs? 
or do we have to just use it and then wait for a proof of ineffectiveness to come along or, or effectiveness after we've just assumed it works anyway? Um, you know, knee washouts and arthroscopies for osteoarthritis and degenerative menisci, we were doing them, you know, in the 70s and 80s, and it took till 200, till 2013 before somebody did a placebo study of degenerative meniscus tears. Um, you know, that's like 40 years of practice before somebody did a study. Surely that should have been done before we introduced it. And this is the example I give. Um, you, I can be specific with this example, um, or I can just call it procedure X. Um, but you develop a new procedure. Um, let's say, you know, um, it's something like a spine fusion or, or something that doesn't have good evidence. Um, but you think it works. Uh, observational data is encouraging. It always is. Um, the procedure becomes common. So people say you can't do a, a, an RCT, it's not ethical. Um, but consider this, what's the ethical balance of doing an RCT of one or 200 patients where they get a 50-50 chance of having this new treatment uh, in a randomized trial? And after that, we will find out whether it works or not. Or we don't do the RCT and we just keep doing the operation, costing tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars, with whatever harms come from it and whatever wastes go with that uh, without ever really knowing if it works. So, you know, the, uh, I think we really need to be, to be generating a little bit more evidence. I'll get to that later. So now what is the evidence for orthopedic surgery and would it actually pass the test? So just to put this in perspective, most, the most common indications for surgery are musculoskeletal, and that's injury and musculoskeletal disorders, you know, particularly arthritic disorders, and degenerative disorders. So they're the most common reasons for surgery, full stop. And in Australia, at least, and it's probably not dissimilar in a lot of other countries, the most costly surgical procedures uh, in order um, are knee replacement, uh, hip replacement, and together they make up uh, roughly a little short of, I think, about 3% of our health budget. Um, spine fusion is up there, but it's number five uh, below um, childbirth and something else. So that's where a lot of our money is going in Australia. Um, so that's putting it in perspective. So we did this study. This is how it all started. I, I had a student and I said, I, I found these other studies looking at what is the evidence for pediatric surgery? What's the evidence for GP decisions? What's the evidence for uh, gastric surgery? Uh, of different types. And I said, well, what's the evidence for orthopedic surgery? And so we looked at our three hospitals, which was a great mix. It was a, a sort of a metropolitan general hospital, a big trauma center and a, a big uh, elective center, you know, where they do joints and, and stuff like that. So it was a real mix of orthopedic surgery. And we, we looked at about over three years, we looked at about 10,000 procedures. And we found that, that uh, of all the different procedures, um, roughly half of them had not been subjected to an RCT, well, exactly half of them, and half of the procedures had been subjected to an RCT, comparing it to not doing it. So that's actually not uncommon, that 50% figure that's similar to other studies in this area. But what was interesting is of the half that had been subjected to an RCT, um, only a little over half had support from at least one RCT and very few had uh, support from uh, a low risk of bias RCT. So there's not a whole lot of support for what we do. So a lot of it doesn't have support, but we're doing it anyway. So there's actually evidence out there uh, that it doesn't work, but we're still doing it. And for these ones here, there's just no evidence one way or the other or no, no RCT evidence. So I expanded on this topic when I was asked to do a talk for pain and I was, they were supposed to fly me to Amsterdam, but then COVID hit. So I ended up um, having to write this paper, do the talk, and the whole time sitting here in my uh, living room. And this is what we came up with. I said, why don't I apply this to surgery for pain? Um, and so uh, we looked at um, surgery for chronic musculoskeletal pain. So this is surgical trials on all common surgeries for musculoskeletal pain. We wanted to look at the proportion of RCTs that compared the procedure to not doing the procedure. This sounds really like simple and kindergarten-y, but this is really what we want to know. 
is, is there an RCT that compares doing it to not doing it? Because you'd be surprised how often those RCTs are not done. And the proportion of those RCTs that are favorable to surgery, my definition of favorable was that the difference had to be statistically significant and clinically important. And we just wanted to see how many of them were blinded just for fun. So this is what we did. We, we looked up a few articles. These are articles looking at um, what cases people presented for their board exams. We looked at the previous study that we did. And uh, we, we looked at, this, is, this was for pain. So this is chronic MSK pain. So it took out uh, uh, fractures. Uh, I took out implant removal. And I took out acute pain uh, and, and things like that. But this is what we ended up with. We ended up about 15 or 16 procedures. So these are all the sort of usual suspects. And then we just searched very broad searches. So for carpal tunnel, we did a search that just said carpal tunnel as a mesh heading, total disc replacement, spine fusion. So we ended up with like 900, 500, 1700 articles, 2300 articles. So we ended up with over 12,000 trials and we just sifted through them and it took a while. But this is the this is a summary of the results. So this one's uh, this one's on shoulders. So I'm going to show you what these four columns are. This one's pretty straightforward. That's just how many trials there were. So for rotator cuff repair, compared to not doing a rotator cuff repair, um, there were uh, 312 trials. There were only four that compared. Sorry, so I'm going to start again. There were 312 RCTs with the topic rotator cuff repair. Of those 312 RCTs that had anything to do with rotator cuff repair, only four of them compared doing the rotator cuff repair to not doing the rotator cuff repair, of which one was favorable. Um, so you can see here subacromial decompression, lots of studies, 15 comparing it to not doing it, and one was favorable. And that one actually I didn't want to include, but I had to, but it was only favorable after I think five years. So none of them were favorable in the short term. Total shoulder replacement, no studies comparing doing it to not doing it. So this is how we went through. And we went through you know, disc replacement. There's one study, uh, uh, you know, spine fusion um, for degenerative conditions. So this is not just back pain. This is also um, uh, spondylolisthesis and fusion or not with decompression uh, for um, revision decompression or for uh, spinal canal stenosis, that kind of thing. Laminectomy for stenosis. This is interesting. I mean, this is a really common operation. We all think it's really good. So there's nearly 400 trials. Four of them compare it to not doing it, but none of them show a clinically important and statistically significant difference. That's like amazing. Um, and so on and so forth. We know there's one RCT for total knees. We know there's none for total hips. Um, and so on. So to summarize this study, we found that uh, it was actually less than 1% of all the RCTs on these topics compared doing it to not doing it, of which only 15% were favorable. 9% were blinded, which was pretty high, but of the blinded studies, none were favorable. So there's no blinded studies that I could find that show that surgery is beneficial for chronic musculoskeletal pain, none. Um, and 85% of the studies that compared doing these procedures and not doing them um, were not favorable for surgery. Now, we did some other reviews. If you want to dig into this a bit deeper, we looked at lumbar spine fusion in particular for any reason. So for degenerative things, spondyl, spondy and uh, trauma and tumor. Um, these are interesting. Interesting that there, there, there was uh, one RCT here um, for, for tumor, showing it to be beneficial. Um, for trauma, the only ones that they had were for, you know, the burst fractures. So we can't really comment on anything else. But for burst fractures, uh, surgery was not beneficial compared to uh, not operating. Um, but for low back pain, degenerative disease, um, there were 33 reviews. This is what I hate. 33 systematic reviews of four trials. No significant uh, advantage. Um, and it gets worse for spine fusion. I had to plug these ones. There's a couple of studies we've done in workers' compensation cohorts where the results are so bad. So in these studies, we found that in this one, for instance, the return to previous duties after 24 months after lumbar spine fusion was 3%. Uh, this one had a 20% reoperation rate after two years. And this one, 89% um, were still taking opioids 
or having physio two years after their fusion. So uh, I don't think it works very well in that population. So why don't we have many trials? Like how come there's just so few trials? Is it, is it the ethics problems? We can't get ethics approvals for surgical trials? No, um, I've gotten ethics approval for lots of surgical trials and actually it's easy getting ethics approval. It's hard getting site specific approvals because of all the rules, but the actual ethics part of it is getting easier. Is it because we don't need them? Well, certainly not. Clearly, I, I hope that I've shown you that we need them. Uh, lack of equipoise? Yeah, quite possibly, um, because surgeons know that their operations work, or they certainly firmly believe that they work. Um, lack of infrastructure and expertise? I think so. I think that there's a, that's a problem. It's changing in the landscape of orthopedics, but certainly it's been a problem for a long time. And lack of incentives. This is the huge one, because I went through uh, MSAC with you before. There's no reason to do an RCT because we're already doing the procedures now. Why do we need to do an RCT to see if it works or not? Uh, don't rock the boat. Um, so why are surgeons still operating? And these are some of the reasons people give me and I'm going to go through these. Um, some surgeons say to me, well, you know, the, but the patient wants to have an arthroscopy, even if they've only got arthritis. Um, and to me, that doesn't make any sense. You know, I see patients all the time with degenerative knees, and I tell them that an arthroscopy is not going to help them because it doesn't work any better than placebo, and they're better off avoiding surgery. And I would say nine times out of 10, they say, oh, that's great. I didn't want to waste my time having surgery, particularly if it doesn't help. So I can't see the patient demand really drives it. I don't buy that one. Uh, the other thing that's been thrown at me as well, um, often, nearly always with arthroscopy of the knee, is that, um, that I don't understand. These patients have failed non-operative treatment and therefore they need you know, operative treatment. And at a superficial level, uh, thinking fast, that kind of makes sense. Um, if something's failed non-operative treatment, well, I guess it needs operative treatment. But when you think about it for more than a few seconds with your slow thinking, it doesn't make sense. Because if you, ha if you have a procedure that doesn't work, um, the failure of another procedure or another treatment doesn't suddenly make it work. It still doesn't work. So I really don't buy that argument. Uh, the other thing that's been pitched at me is, well, if we can't do knee arthroscopies, are you expecting us to do knee replacements on every patient that comes along? And I don't think that's a reasonable alternative because what those surgeons often don't think of is that you can always treat them non-operatively. The other one, I've had this actually many times, um, and that is, uh, so it's a placebo, who cares? And one surgeon said to me um, that the 2013 placebo study uh, looking at um, knee arthroscopy and uh, partial meniscectomy for degenerative tears uh, is fantastic, and he's going to do lots of arthroscopies now. And I asked him why, and he said, because two-thirds of the patients got better. Um, it doesn't matter, they got better in both groups. Uh, they got better the same. Uh, he says, I don't care you know, what the mechanism is. Uh, they get better, so I'm going to keep doing it. Um, I don't know whether I really need to explain that to this audience, but um, there's problems with that. Um, or do surgeons just believe that the operations work? And yeah, I, I do. And I've said this in many interviews. Um, homeopaths. So homeopathy, we know, can't work, right? It, it just, it, it doesn't work. It, it hasn't been shown to work and, and it, it can't work. Well, let's take that as, as true for this argument. Um, I don't believe that homeopaths wake up in the morning thinking they're going to go and fleece some people or commit fraud or rip some people off. I think homeopaths actually believe that what they do works. And they believe that what they do works for the same reason that surgeons believe that whatever it is that they do that doesn't have evidence works. Um, and I, I'm picking on neoarthroscopy, but I, I gave a debate at a live meeting, so it must have been pre-COVID. And it was on, uh, I was talking about tennis elbow, and a surgeon got up in the audience and he said, he said, that's rubbish. Um, surgery is uh, fantastic for tennis elbow. And I explained to him that 98% that of people get better in 12 months. And so that's why everything seems to work. And he said, he said no, those operations don't work. Um, I know the operation that does work and my operation works every single time. And this guy actually believed it worked. He wasn't trying to have me on. Um, he has a procedure for tennis elbow that he believes works. And, and in his world, it does because 98% of his patients will get better. Um, and, and so he's, he's committing this sort of logical fallacy 
Um, you can download plenty of these correlations, not causation things from the internet. Um, uh, polio rates and ice cream sales in 1949. Um, you know, the obvious confounder here is that they both peak in summer. But the, the same logical fallacy applies of post hoc ergo propter hoc, which means it follows, therefore, is, it is because of. And really, I think it's a lack of science literacy. You know, I, I wasn't taught evidence based medicine in medicine. Um, I had to learn it myself, and I'm still learning it, and it's really hard. Um, but we've got to strive for better. Um, and, it's, and it's this kind of thinking that has a surgeon look at two randomized trials of knee arthroscopy, the one on the left being the lowest quality randomized trial. In fact, I've read this and I'm not sure that it was actually randomized, but it's listed as a randomized trial. Um, and uh, the one on the right, which was a blinded placebo trial. And they will believe this one on the left. And despite all the evidence to the contrary, about knee arthroscopy for arthritis, I've had surgeons hold this trial up and just say, but they did this trial in 1995 and it was fantastic. Um, and you, you still see it today. Um, surgeons have a skewed view of how effective what they do is. This has actually been shown. We, we've shown it in a couple of studies looking at uh, a joint replacement and looking at tibia fractures. Tibia fractures, the example was we asked the surgeons after so many months how satisfied are you with the outcome of the tibia fracture on this particular patient? And on average, they were 67%, two thirds of them thought that the tibia fracture did really well. Um, and uh, then we asked those exact patients, how well do you think your tibia went? And it was 44%. And it's consistent, it's been shown in this systematic review that clinicians consistently overestimate the benefit and underestimate the harms of what we do. And you see it in our literature from my, my favorite journal, the American Journal of Sports Medicine. So this is yet another systematic review. So this is like I showed you, there's a systematic review every couple of weeks on the evidence for um, arthroscopy, arthroscopy for meniscus tears. And this is just another one of them. And the title of this is The Urgent Need for Evidence for um, menis, 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 Meniscal Surgery. Um, you think I'd be able to say it by now. And so what they found is the same as every other review. They found no difference between arthroscopic debridement compared with non operative treatment. And so their conclusion to their findings was that more research is urgently needed to support meniscal surgery. So what they're saying is, look, we've looked at all the evidence and it's bad. There's lots of really good trials out there and they all show that arthroscopy doesn't work better than not doing it. So we need to keep doing studies until we find the one that shows that it works because we know it works. Because we see people get better. It's this post hoc ergo propter hoc problem. Um, and I used to see them get better all the time too. I used to do this operation uh, a lot when I started my practice. But the trouble is I used to see them get better when I had a chat to them in the anesthetic bay preoperatively. So they'd be on my waiting list for a couple of months. They'd come in, I'd say, how's the knee going? They're going, yeah, it's been really good. I'm like, well, what are you doing here? Oh, I thought I'd better have the operation just in case. Um, and even to the point of editorials in my second favorite journal, Arthroscopy, um, this is about the placebo trial. Patients who may not be of entirely sound mind are selected and research performed on such individuals would not be generalizable to mentally healthy patients. That hasn't been retracted, that still stands. You can look that one up. So finally, what can we do about it? I think, you know, you've got to have a standard. Like, you look at other scientific endeavors and the burden of proof um, and, and, and what they need before they will, you know, blast a rocket up into the air or whatever. And it's really high. You look at simple drugs, painkillers, whatever. The standard is really high. But surgery, we just really, we almost don't have a standard. And we need to flip the evidence requirement. We, don't, we shouldn't be doing things and then waiting for someone to come along and test it. We need to test it prior to or with introduction. So we need to generate the evidence. And people go, well, you're gonna hold up the introduction of new treatments. No, you're not, introduce it, introduce it today. You know, you got a new operation, go for it, but only do it as part of a trial. So we can find out if it works or not. Um, and do so efficiently because trials are getting harder and more expensive to do. And so this is why I think we, this is one of my big pushes is fusing clinical practice with research. And a lot of the trials I'm doing now are, are, are this, they're just taking normal practice. So we just finished a big study we're about to submit um, 
And uh, we looked at aspirin versus clexane, uh, low molecular weight heparin for um, hip and knee replacement, uh, VTE prophylaxis, because ever since I've been an intern, people have been arguing about that. Um, and nobody's done the big trial. I mean, it, literally nobody has done the big trial. Um, there's been one decent trial, and it's not even decent, uh, comparing aspirin to clexane. I can't believe that. One. And it recruited 778 patients and was stopped early um, because of uh, feet, they just couldn't get the numbers. It's, and that was nowhere near enough to actually conclude anything. I just cannot believe it. So we did the study. We recruited in less than two years, and we recruited nearly 10,000 patients. It can be done just by doing it in normal practice. And we didn't even have to consent patients because both treatments were routine care. So there are efficient ways of doing it. We can do it cheaply. So in summary, evidence supporting most orthopedic procedures is lacking. Evidence is not compatible with common practice and a more scientific approach is needed. This surgery is not approved. Thank you, Mo.